the 2014 Long Beach elections will be remembered as historical for many reasons. There are five city council seats elected, our city attorney, members of the Long Beach City College Board, the Long Beach Unified School District Board, we have political veterans versus newcomers, new visions juxtaposed established tradition, and then there is the race for mayor. We had 10 initial candidates for mayor, contributing to the most expensive race for mayor in the history of our city. Over $1.6 million total were spent, and roughly $40 per vote spent by the top five candidates. And how did we, the citizens of Long Beach, show our interests? only 14.2% of voters turned out for the April primary. On this program, we decided to take a different approach in our attempt to educate and motivate the citizens of Long Beach to engage and vote in the June 3rd runoff. On this program, we will have a conversation with the two candidates that think you should vote for them as your next mayor of Long Beach. We have Mr. Damon Dunn, who believes that the mayor's position is a CEO position and Mr. Robert Garcia, who looks at the mayor's position as an ambassador. Mr. Dunn has been in Long Beach since 2011. Mr. Garcia is a longtime resident of Long Beach who attended Cal State University Long Beach and currently works for the city. Mr. Dunn believes the mayor is chief executive of the city. Mr. Garcia believes the mayor is the ambassador in chief. Mr. Dunn believes that business acumen is an important leadership strength. Mr. Garcia, wants Long Beach to become the Silicon Valley of the South. Mr. Dunn once ran as a Republican for Secretary of State, Mr. Garcia, founder of the Long Beach Young Republicans, and eventually became a Democrat. Mr. Dunn would be the youngest and first African-American mayor. Mr. Garcia would be the youngest and first Latino and openly gay mayor. The list goes on, and now we will add a unique candidate's perspective that we think you will find most interesting. If you're watching this broadcast live, we're taking questions from the public during the second half of this show. To send us your questions, go to our website at padnet.tv elections. Click the link for tonight's show and post your questions to the Facebook event page. Each candidate will have two minutes to address your questions and we'll get through as many as time will allow. Thank you for joining us for our Election Perspectives show. Welcome back. And now that you've had an introduction and you know what to expect, I'd like to introduce and welcome our two guests. Thank you, Damon Dunn, for being here, and Thank you. Robert Garcia. I, Thank you. I've had the pleasure of, of knowing both of you gentlemen over the years, and, and it's quite an honor for me to sit here and talk to you about a subject that's so important, not only to you and to me, but to the citizens that are watching. And so we look forward to that kind of dialogue that we hope is a little bit more unique than what you've had to do where the questions were pointed and, and it was so structured. The first question I have for you is, what have you learned about yourself in the election so far? I know you've worked very hard to get to this seat today. Let's start with you, Damon. What have you learned so far about yourself in these elections? You know, I think I've learned that um, I can walk 12,000 doors. <laughs> it was an ambitious goal when we first uh, laid out our campaign plan right. uh, to walk 12,000 doors, to have an opportunity to make uh, personal relationships. And in doing that, uh, I learned that you know people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Right. The opportunity to listen to their heart, to their issues, and to champion them, it, it's been a great learning curve for me. And you, Robert, what about you? You know, I've always, uh, as a longtime Long Beach guy, I've always loved our city. And I am so proud to be a Long Beach resident, so proud to have gone to school here, uh, to own a home here. But the one thing that I was surprised about this process is the love of, of, of city and the love of community during the process of campaigning even grew. And I was able to go into neighborhoods and talk to uh, communities and uh, be welcomed into homes. 
-hmm. of places that I had, you know, rediscovered in Long Beach. And I think that mm -hmm. having conversations with people, getting to know what their hopes are, what their dreams are for their city, uh, being able to go to uh, neighborhoods and historic homes and view the history of what Long Beach is really about uh, was something that I learned. I, I, I didn't think I could love my city anymore. Mm -hmm. And throughout this process, uh, I've even gained an even stronger love and affection uh, for Long Beach, for the diversity of Long Beach, and certainly for the diversity of our neighborhoods. And staying with you then on that on that particular theme, because this takes, I, I can't even imagine the energy, you know, the hours that you put in, your teams put in, uh, the shots that you take uh, from people uh, for sometimes maybe reasons that you can't imagine why. But what inspires you both? What inspires you to, to push through all of that? Why is this so important to you? You know, for me, I think, I, I always like to say that the best day of my life was the day I became an American. And, you know, I grew up as an immigrant uh, in the United States. I uh, grew up with not a lot of support, uh, but whether financially. Uh, there were eight of us in a small apartment growing up. And the process of becoming an American and a U.S. citizen changed my life, and it changed my family's life. Mm -hmm. And I'll never be able to give back to my country what my country has given to me. And I will always remember that day that I was able to raise my right hand and become a, a U.S. citizen, and as American as everybody else in Long Beach. And so I'm driven by a sense of, of duty to my community, of love of my country, of love of my community. And I believe that government has a role to help people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm doing this. Uh, Damon, I know that anyone who's heard your story, is, it's an amazing story. But when you put that story and then what you've done as a professional and now you're here, what, what is it that inspires you and motivates you for this? Yeah, I think, you know, I grew up in, in very difficult circumstances. You know, mm -hmm. my father was killed when I was three. You know, my mom had me at 16 years old and I was left with my grandparents and slept with two uncles for the first 12 years of my life and watched both of them go to prison. My mom, she came back and um, we moved into the inner city and then I watched two of my friends get murdered at a birthday party. Uh, but I also learned the value of an education, that education was my way up and my way out. Mm -hmm. And to invest in that, to become a straight A student, to earn a scholarship to Stanford University, and to make good on that scholarship, to be a really good student, earn academic all Pac-10, all Pac-10 in football, and ultimately going to run my own business. I want to make sure that other people have that same opportunity. And that's what inspires me. I've done uh, a lot in my life. But I feel that to whom much is given, much is required. If I can take the lessons I've learned and help other people unlock some of those doors that I was able to unlock, uh, then that to me is a, is, is a life well worth living and, and the service that's well worth providing. Now, both of you talk, and it's a, it's a noble cause that, yeah. that we talk about. And you mentioned walking 12,000 doors, I believe you said. Yeah. And yet the low voter turnout, when you think about that, what thoughts go through your head and, and what would you say to people who are looking or that they can tell others who aren't looking so that we can improve upon that? Because I, read, I think I read one story where they said that the voter turnout in Afghanistan with the Taliban watching was higher than it was in Long Beach wow. on something so important. That's a profound statement, but what would right. you say, what are your thoughts about that? I think one thing that, that's critically important is that we have to understand why people don't vote. And as opposed to attacking people, we need to say, you know what, what, what issues are there? I think there are communities, particularly in poor communities, people don't mm -hmm. vote. And I grew up in a family that never voted. And so I, I dealt with that issue. And so mm -hmm. I know that people feel as if they're not connected sometimes to their political leaders, that mm -hmm. the political leaders don't always come into those communities. Where I grew up, they didn't, they didn't come to my community. And sometimes you don't know how voting will lead to you know, that job or how voting can lead to just putting food on your table or how voting is gonna help your broken family. And so it takes you know, civic leaders like myself and Robert to be able to go back to our communities and say, hey look, this is how supporting the right person, that person who wants mm -hmm. to come back and help and open doors, which I think we both would do, um, mm -hmm. can make a difference. And we have to make that connection mm -hmm. between how your vote impacts the food mm -hmm. on your table, your kid mm -hmm. being able to go to college, uh, you've been able to put food on your table, et cetera. It's interesting you say that because a young man who works here for us asked me that very question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Simpson, I know you're really connected in this city, but when I think about politics, will it really matter if I vote? And, and that, that disconnect between his vote and what you can make happen uh, was important. Robert, what would you add to this? Well, I think voting is really important. I think it's, uh, it's you know, it really is... Uh, part of your duty as, as uh, being a citizen and being someone that uh, tries to be engaged. I think that uh, people, we do need to encourage people to vote. Whoever they vote for, it's important to right. vote. Uh, you know, for me, I, voting is so important because I just, I, we had to fight so hard to become Americans to get a chance to vote. And so I take the ability to vote and voting in elections very seriously. It's very important. 
I don't think I've ever missed a vote since I became uh, a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something, and, and my and I like Damon. I grew up in a very uh, you know poor family, and no one in my family voted as well. Uh, but I think if you want to care about your community, I think it's good to engage. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited that a lot of people, young people that that turned uh, 18 in this last election for the very first time. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of people say the cast are the first vote ever, they ever have uh, for me for mayor, and I, I, I appreciate that. It's important uh, to get out and vote. Now, when to continue with you on that particular subject and talking about the people, what beyond what we've already discussed would you say that it's that one thing that maybe has impressed you about the people of Long Beach, knowing that you've both met so many people that we wouldn't ordinarily meet maybe in our daily walks of life, but you've had to cross the whole spectrum. What would you say really sticks out in your mind, Robert, about the people you've met of Long Beach? I think what really defines people in Long Beach is our, our love of diversity right. and our love of difference. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I love about our city is the fact that uh, whether you're young or older, uh, whether you live in East Long Beach or North Long Beach, Central Long Beach, whether you're straight, gay, black, white, Latino, immigrant or not, there's a sense of community. And I think that Long Beach sticks up for each other. Uh, Long Beach supports each other. Uh, this is a community that uh, I can't tell you how many times I walk down the street and I'll see someone that I haven't seen in 20 years since mm -hmm. our days back at Cal State Long Beach or at Long Beach City College. And there's a sense of community that we know each other. There's a history, uh, mm -hmm. I think, to, uh, to Long Beach. And people here uh, respect uh, wherever you came from. I think we all, we all work together. And I, I really love that about our city. I, I love the diversity as well. I mean, it's what you know really attracted me to living here. I lived here the first time, 2000, 2001, when I played in the XFL. Um, but as I've got a chance now to walk 12,000 doors, you know, the thing that I've found out that's really interesting is that Long Beach residents are very independent. Right? When I knocked on doors and asked people what issues do you care most about, people didn't ask me, well, how long have you lived here? Nobody asked me, are you Republican, are you a Democrat? People cared about their issues. And I think they reject partisan politics. People just want you know, someone who's independent, mm -hmm. uh, someone who's going to work for them on their issues. And I love that, uh, you know, about the residents here, that it's about all of us being at the table, mm -hmm. everything being on the table, and all of us moving forward together. No more, div you know, divisive politics. Uh, I think that's that's a pretty much a natural here. It's a given here. And, and I love that about the people in Long Beach. Now, I would imagine you both have been asked hundreds of questions, if not more, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in the last year, let's say. Yeah. But what have we missed? What is that one question that you wish they would have asked you that, that you really haven't been able to, to give that answer that you think would, that the city needs to hear, that we need to hear as we go to June 3rd? Does anything come to mind, Damon, that, that you just wish someone would have put it a different way to you? Yeah, you know, you know to be here, mm -hmm. there's a lot that it took to be here. Mm -hmm. right? I, I didn't, I didn't, it was a very difficult journey. It was a long journey. And it takes a lot of um, encouragement it mm -hmm. takes a lot of uh, strength to be able to stand up against people who doubt you. There are things where I grew up where I didn't have a father, and I had to push and pursue through that. Uh, there were things when I grew up I didn't have access to quiet study places. Uh, I was surrounded by a lot of violence. And, you know, you get to a Stanford University, I don't think I was culturally ready to go into an environment because I came from this all African-American community and learning how to break through that. I think that, you know, I would love voters to, to ask, you know, how did you get to where you are, not mm -hmm. just about what are the policies that, you, um, that you're going to support and that you're going to project, but, but what did it take for you as a person mm -hmm. to be able to break through all the difficult challenges and the obstacles? Mm -hmm. Basically, how did you see the possibilities when the plausible outcome and the probable outcomes that you would have been in jail or that I would have been a statistic, how did you overcome that? And I think that, quite honestly, mm -hmm. um, is really the secret you know, to my success, it's the secret to my intellectual, you know, pedigree and development. It's the success, it's the, the success behind the success. Gotcha. And if people understand that about me, mm -hmm. then they'll say, you know what? Um, I get why he supports these policies and I get why, why he would be the best person for the job. What do we miss in your case, Robert, that you just wish somebody would have asked that because you were ready for it? Yeah, you know, we, we've, been, we've been asked a lot of questions. <laughs> I, I yeah. think we've done probably 25 of these or so. Right. I think that in order to really get to know me as a person, you'd probably have to sit around uh, my family dinner table for, for dinner. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, the one thing about, about me is I'm incredibly uh, grateful and loving 
And I am so thankful to have a family and the upbringing that I was able to have. We didn't have much, but we had love, we had faith, we had uh, hard work. And we had, I had personally had three incredibly strong women in my life, uh, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt, who instilled uh, important values. And I think that when we get together at the dinner table, whether it's a Sunday night or and kind of sit around and, and talk, uh, we talk about very personal things, about our, 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 our faith, about our helping community, about giving back to our, our country. And I think uh, you can learn a lot about people, I think, in their family settings. Yeah. And I'm fortunate to have uh, grown up in a, in a, with, with three very great women in my life. Now, I think that uh, and it's said that one of the most important jobs that you will have, maybe about next January, one of you will be doing a, a State of the City address. And um, when you think about jumping forward for a moment, what would you like the theme of your first State of the City address to be? When you think about all that you've been through and what you will have to go through between now and then, what would be that theme? Let's start with you, Robert, in terms of you would like to stand up in front of Long Beach and say, you know, this is where we're at. Well, I'll, certainly I think it's important to note that I think what Mayor Foster did in making the State of the City a public event was really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly committed to that and for it to continue to be a public event, okay. uh, not, a, you know, not a corporate event or a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And I really want Long Beach to believe in itself. I really want Long Beach to take that next, next step forward. We're a city of almost half a million people. We have the largest seaport in the country. We have one of the best urban school districts. We have an incredibly rich university. And I, when I talk to a lot of people, people feel like you know, this is a great place. We've got to tell our story mm -hmm. in a new way. And so mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that uh, it's a message that's a positive message. It's a message about Long Beach. Mm -hmm. It's a message about what our strengths are and how we can come together as a community and really promote and sell all the great assets that we have. Uh, mm -hmm. People love living here. They love their neighborhood. Uh, people are happy generally uh, mm -hmm. in Long Beach, even in some of our challenged communities. Right. And I think we need to harness that energy and move our city forward. And what we'll be listening to when, when you're up there, Damon? It'll be about accountability. It'll be about measuring the things that we said we were going to do and did we, did we do them? Did we accomplish them? You know, I want to be held accountable, you know, come January. Uh, here's the plan we say we're going to do. Did we do these things? Did we make improvements in jobs in Long Beach, right? Did, did we at least go through a checklist of 50, 60 things and, and, and whether some of them fail and some of them might not, uh, some of them might succeed? Mm -hmm. um, you know, did we change the culture in City Hall? Did we get control of the issues that we have at our port? We don't have an executive director. We have, I think, five or six director level and assistant director level positions. Uh, were we able to bring our shipping partners together uh, that are represented by PMSA and our harbor commissioners to say, you know what, let's have new rules of engagement. No more going to the press. No more talking about our issues outside of these closed confines. There's new rules here. And I want to be able to stand there and have the uh, the residents of Long Beach say, you said you were going to do these things. Uh, did you do these things? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's how, uh, I think the things that get measured are the things that get done. I want to be held accountable. And if I'm doing a good job, let's keep doing the job. If I'm not doing a good job, then I won't deserve another opportunity at the end of four years. And, and I would respect that. Speaking of respect that and, and a good job, another important role of the mayor, as you know, will be uh, presiding over city council meetings. Yeah. Uh, as people watch those meetings or attend those meetings, what could they expect uh, different or maybe the same uh, from you both in terms of how council meetings will flow under your leadership? Robert, would you start with that one? Sure. I think, first of all, you know, I, I bring to uh, the council and I have, I think, a sense of consensus building. I've always been mm -hmm. a consensus builder on the city council. I believe you have to work together to form, uh, form ideas and policy. And mm -hmm. it's good to have healthy debate. It's good to have healthy discussion. But it's important that we do it in a, res in a way that's respectable. I think that right. The mayor is uh, someone that brings people together and trying to move moves the debate forward. Uh, I'm also proud that I've got great relationships on the city council, including a lot of the incoming uh, council members. Uh, I've worked with uh, council member elect Roberto Yoranga at the community college. Right. I've known council member elect Susie Price for almost 20 years mm -hmm. when we were at Cal State Long Beach. A lot of the new members coming in, whether it be uh, others, I've, I've had that relationship with. Mm -hmm. I also know a lot of the current members that'll be there. And so I think that it's important for us to move forward in a positive way and mm -hmm. uh, promote a positive vision for the city of Long Beach. Absolutely. And Damon, what yeah, would we expect I, from you? I think relationships are important. I mean, mm -hmm. critically, we have to, clearly we have to, um, you know, build con uh, consensus. But I think even more important uh, is understanding, you know, the city council uh, members are part-time. 
And because they're part time, they don't do all the heavy lifting that staff and the mayor will have to do. And so they're important projects that are that will come on the agenda. And the mayor all week long will have to plow through the difficult, dense data and, and discern what is most germane and be able to develop solutions. You take the Civic Center project. What is one hundred and nineteen million dollar uh, retrofit get you and how does that impact your general fund if you bond against that or if you try to pay that out over term and how does that compare to a public private partnership and when you dig into the depth of those numbers and know the analytical data behind it now you have the opportunity on Tuesdays to be able to shape the discussion you, the mayor does not get a vote but the mayor can shape the discussion so that the city council members are in the best position then to be able to make a decision but the mayor's responsibility is to make sure we do all that heavy lifting all week long to understand the issues 360 degrees all the alternatives uh, inside and out and then be able to share that uh, that input along with city staff at the meeting so that the city council members uh, can understand what is the best position to put our general fund and, and I will provide that at every uh, Tuesday council session. And we have a few minutes before we go to our first break and I want to ask you if you both could succinctly answer the question Robert you've been on the uh, city council and it's, it's clear that in the in the last years we've had a positive swing in terms of the financial position of, of the city. Uh, Starting with you, Robert, uh, Damon, how would you continue as mayor to keep the city on that path of, of finance, financial responsibility and, uh, and financial growth uh, for the city of Long Beach? Yeah, clearly the job of the mayor is to make sure you protect the treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you're going to put someone in that office uh, and all, the, all, the, all of our tax dollars are going into the general fund and we need to make sure uh, that we are negotiating contracts in 2015 with IAM and with public safety in 2016 uh, that allow us to have our expenses in alignment with our revenues mm -hmm. uh, and that's the job and, and the mayor needs to be able to do it. Uh, I think I'll be independent enough uh, and I have the fiscal discipline to make sure that I protect the treasury for our, for our, for our residents so that we can pay for the services, mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure, public safety and the other after school hours, library hours that we need. But that'll be my number one priority, protect the treasury. And I know, Robert, you've been involved in that process, so yeah. would there be things that you would continue or new, new ideas that you would bring to the table to continue making that go forward? Well, as you know, I mean, I have a record on this, so right. and I think the record is pretty clear. Right. I'm running on a record of fiscal responsibility and stability right. that we have done. We've taken the city from a huge deficit. In fact, right. when I was elected, we had a $40 million budget mm -hmm. deficit mm -hmm. to the first surplus in 10 years. We've reformed our public pensions to say the city over 250 million over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. We've our reserves are now are, are a better, stronger place. We've got more money in our reserves. We're paying down our unfunded liability and pensions. And so, the, what we've done over the last few years has been really a great step forward when it comes to our finances. I absolutely plan on keeping that kind of fiscal austerity that we've done. Uh, we've made cuts across the board, but. Oftentimes, I believe we've been able to reform government in a way, even though it's leaner, in some cases it's been more, even more effective. And so mm -hmm. consolidation of departments, moving the city forward in the right direction financially, we'll keep all that going. Now, we've heard about Boeing leaving, Mercedes coming. Uh, some people say Long Beach isn't business friendly, others might say it is. But as mayor, uh, and what would be just uh, that elevator pitch uh, because we only have about two minutes before we go to our, our first break. What would be that elevator pitch that you might pitch to uh, a new business to get them to come to Long Beach? Go ahead, Damon. I mean, we, we have the diversity in our population. Uh, we have great university here at Cal State Long Beach. We're producing students uh, that can go right to work and be employed. And we're going to have a mayor and a city council that's going to be engaged in saying, how can we make a deal? What can we do? That's what's happening in Texas where, you know, Governor Perry came here, cut a deal with Toyota. They're leaving Torrance to go there. We have to be willing to give concessions, perhaps in sales tax, business tax. You know, we're open for business. We're willing to change our internal procedures to be able to make permitting processes easier. Uh, and as mayor, I will lead the charge in doing that. All right. Robert. Well, I all certainly believe in, uh, in ensuring that we're open for business, but we're always going to also support our workers and make sure that our workers are protected in the right way uh, mm -hmm. as we're bringing in business as well. But the pitch that I make to, to, to people and to business is that we have a great city. We have mm -hmm. the only downtown by the water between San Diego and San Francisco. We have one of the best urban school districts in the country. You look at Cal State Long Beach, the number one applied to Cal State in the state of California with a top engineering program, a top communications program. The Port of Long Beach, the economic engine of America, this is the place to be. We have blue lines straight into downtown Los Angeles. So this is a, we have the assets. We have, a, 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 I think, an incredibly robust place for business to be here. But we got to do a better job of selling Long Beach. 
in the region, abroad. You know, I've been endorsed by Mayor Garcetti. I think I want to partner with the mayor of Los Angeles to ensure that we're creating a regional approach uh, to jobs as well. And I think we've got a lot to sell here. Wow, I mean, the energy is, is great. I mean, you guys are both uh, very enthusiastic about what you do. I, I know enough about, both about both of you uh, to, um, to know that you're very passionate about this job. And uh, I think uh, we're very fortunate as a community uh, to have two people uh, who want it as bad as you seem to want it. When we come back, uh, we're going to keep this energy level going. And we're going to do it with your support there at home because we've got to uh, get your questions asked of our two candidates here. And I'm going to be receiving them both on the iPad and from the staff here in the studio so that we can get through as many of them as we can. Know that the candidates will have just two minutes per question so that we can try to get through as many as we can. So don't go away, we have lots more to come. At the Long Beach Community Action Partnership, we're very proud of the millions of dollars that we provide in utility assistance services. And we're also proud of the thousands of people that we assist, including youth, adults, and seniors. But what we're most proud of are the relationships that we build one-on-one -on -one with people just like you to build a stronger community. Join us in changing lives and making a difference. They have uh, offered me opportunities. They allow me to utilize equipment that they have. I get to practice more so than I would with the supplies that I have, with the equipment that I have. Uh, I'm learning how to work again with more people and how to actually work in an actual studio and working with the cameras and hands-on. I remember they said like, lamp as in leadership. You know, I learned a little bit about how to become a leader as well as like, you know, communicating with the people I work around with. You know, after being here, you know, all the teaching, all the skills I've been learning, it, you know, it became easy. It's like learning the alphabet. And from like, you know, we start from the bottom and then we go up. We start learning all these new skills. Things that we thought that it was, you know, really hard becomes easy. Welcome back, I'm Derek Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership, and I have the honor to be here this evening with Mr. Robert Garcia and Mr. Damon Dunn, both gentlemen of which are the finalists in our run for Mayor of Long Beach in 2014. Uh, in the first part of our show, we asked them questions more to allow you to find out who they are as individuals because business and life is based on relationships. And I think that you heard that we have pretty special candidates here that we can be proud of in this city. In this particular part of the show, we're going to try our technology out. And we're going to do that by engaging you and asking some of the questions that you sent to us via uh, Facebook and our social media page. The first question that I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, is from Mike Clemson. Uh, it's a long question, but the bottom line of the question is, what will you do to make it so people who live here can actually afford to live here? And he puts it in the context of what salaries are and that the average house in Long Beach might cost $400,000, but the average salary in Long Beach would only allow for a $250,000 home. So there's a disconnect in, in terms of what people are earning and what could, they can afford here. So what would you do to help uh, people join the ranks of home ownership? Damon, let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's an interesting concept uh, that he talked, to, he put it in an interesting context mm -hmm. uh, about salaries. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, to have people be able to afford homes at the $400,000 range, salaries are going to have to increase, which means we need jobs that pay salaries at a, higher, at a higher level. And I think what we've seen over the last 20 years in Long Beach is kind of a degradation uh, of our employment, you know, from higher income jobs with the Naval Shipyard leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at a lot of the aerospace, uh, you know, companies that are, that, that are leaving and Boeing, even though they're going to bring a thousand jobs from Seattle here, 
uh, we're probably going to lose another 2,000, 2,500 when they stop production of the C-17. Right. And so the average and median income is going to drop even further. So the only way to, to lift those numbers, to have people that can afford uh, more expensive homes, is to bring jobs in. We have to go out and figure out, you know, if we have 1,500 unemployed people uh, that are that are that have background in aerospace engineering, manufacturing, design, support, can we go talk with Boeing and ask them, you know what, you guys have $4.5 trillion of orders for commercial planes over the next 20 years. I read that in the Wall Street Journal. Maybe we can deploy, you know, the asset you have here in the, in the capital building you have, but then also in the human capital that you have. Can we do that? Uh, we have to look at creative ways to get companies to want to expand here and to want uh, to come here in order to have jobs at a level uh, that pay higher wages so people can have buy homes that are more affordable. Okay. And Mr. Garcia? I mean, I think there's different ways to answer, to answer it. I think first, I think, uh, Damon touched on the jobs issue. I mean, the jobs issue is incredibly important. We've got to make sure that we're building the economy of tomorrow. We've got to make sure that we're focused on the new economy, whether it's technology and healthcare, mm -hmm. the green economy, solar. This is all going to be in our future in the city. We've got to make sure that the jobs of the poor remain in place. But there's another piece of this, and I think that this is important too, is we also as a city have to do a better job of helping those that really need our help and support. Right. One issue is housing, for example, and I think the, the question alludes to that. Yes. We've got to do a better job of making sure that if there's a young graduate at a Cal State Long Beach and they've worked hard, they're taking out a college loan, mm -hmm. they, they're a first-time teacher, they're going to teach at Long Beach Unified, mm -hmm. that, that student, that new teacher cannot afford to buy a home in Long Beach. So mm -hmm. are we building the type of housing that's going to allow that teacher uh, that might be uh, recently married, uh, maybe with another teacher. Uh, how can they purchase that first home in Long Beach? We want them, I want them here. I want them to start their family here. I want them to be able to buy their first home here. So that's gonna be important. And the second piece of this is also the, on the wage issue. I've been a supporter of whenever possible, if the city of Long Beach and as a city and municipality were able to moderately increase wages, particularly for workers that are really at the low income level, like we did for our hotel workers, our convention workers, and our workers at the airport. And if we're able to give them a moderate increase at the, at the minimum wage level, then they're able to uplift themselves and their family, save a little money, and hopefully someday be able to, to buy a small apartment in the city of Long Beach. We want home ownership to go up. Fortunately, uh, there's a lot of good measures as far as home, household income that's right. happening in different parts of our city. So our city is growing correctly in the right area, but there's a lot more to do still. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question came in from Laurie Angel. Uh, it's, rel it's related to the, the, the comments about both of you having roots uh, at some point in time in the Republican Party. And I'll paraphrase in the question that asks, why did each change, why did each of you change uh, parties and how will that affect how you stand on issues as the mayor and primary representative for the city of Long Beach. How heavily will party affiliations influence you as you take a lead on a lead on positions in regional, state, and national light? Yeah, for me, a party will have zero impact uh, on the on the positions I take. Have zero impact on the policies that I pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm making it clear that I'm my own man. I'm standing on my own ideas. I'm funding a tremendous amount of my own campaign because when you're not a part of a party, you don't have the grassroots that will organize for you and walk doors, and you don't have necessarily the donors that come with the party affiliation to be able to give to your campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, but the beauty of it, what you do get, is your your political freedom. Right mm -hmm. to say what you want, to stand on your own ideas, and then when you're in office, there is the opportunity uh, to not owe any debts, uh, to not have to listen to any lobbyist, and not to have to repay any favors. And so I look forward to being able to lead uh, with the freedom of my own ideas and being able to lead for uh, the voters in Long Beach, the residents in Long Beach, in a way in which is intellectually honest uh, and free of all encumbrance. Thank you. And Mr. Garcia. Sure. I mean, I'm Certainly back when I was in college, uh, I you know, and began realizing who I was politically and where my values were. Uh, I began to change uh, w what I believed in. I, you know, like, like a lot of immigrants uh, at the time, uh, and like my family did, you, know, you register one way, and then when you're old enough, you make your, your choices about where you go. And mm -hmm. uh, I've, been, I've been a Democrat now for a while, certainly as long as I've been elected. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think, though, that for me, at least, um, I'm running to be mayor of everyone. I don't care if people are Republicans, Democrats, independents. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm also proud to, to be a Democrat. I'm proud of uh, the party's values. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I believe in, uh, in gays and lesbians being equal and having the right to marry. You know, I believe in the government has a role to help people, uh, that we have a role to give them access to health care, and those are reasons why uh, I'm a Democrat. 
But as far as Long Beach itself, I believe that uh, you know we, as, as in the role of mayor, you're there uh, to support everyone. And regardless of what maybe your personal values or your personal beliefs are, I certainly know what mine are. Uh, I think that that's, that's different. You know, you're not up there uh, as head of a political party. You're up there uh, as mayor of the city. Right. Brandon Bryant has a question, and that question is uh, for both of you, and it's Long Beach voters have consistently shown support for access to med medical cannabis as per the voter-approved Prop 215. Long Beach has no legally operating dispensaries currently due to a ban, which I believe was drafted by Mr. Garcia and approved by City Council. If elected, what will you do to protect Long Beach citizens' privacy and access to their medicine? And it looks like this question was chosen because we had several on this particular topic. So okay. Brandon's happened to be the one that we're asking. Okay. Uh, first, I'll say that I, I also support a woman's right to choose, and I support, I understand that all people are created equal. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation or, or your, uh, what your gender is or what your ethnicity, but more specifically to this question here, uh, the people who need uh, you know, medical marijuana, they ought to have access to it. I think that we all agree to that, and I think we want to make sure we keep the bad guys out. Right, the mm -hmm. people who are trying to proliferate it in an illegal way. Mm -hmm. uh, we also want to make sure the people who are going in to get it actually have prescriptions uh, and they have the right to have access to it. So people who are not underage mm -hmm. and people who are not uh, eligible, we want to make sure that they're not doing that. And I think that we put a ban in place and it was responsible. I think we may have had 80 plus medical marijuana dispensaries and you could not uh, you know, realistically and logistically um, uh, regulate those facilities. But now we go down to ordinance that says two per district we can pretty much regulate, you know, uh, 18 medical marijuana facilities and say, you know what, who's coming in and making sure that only the people who should get it can have it, mm -hmm. uh, and making sure only the people who are operating it, or rather people who are operating it, uh, have the rights to operate it, that there is no illegal activity, and that the actual marijuana that they are actually, um, you know, serving uh, is not uh, laced with any illegal substances, et cetera. So regulation is key. Uh, and, and doing that at a measurable size and measurable number of facilities is key, but guaranteeing access for people uh, who need it. Okay, Mr. Garcia. Well, I, I, you know, I would agree that um, the, the the challenge of me, uh, medicinal cannabis in Long Beach has been uh, very complex. I think what we tried to do initially is often come up with a regulation that provided safe access citywide. The courts came in and changed that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the uh, we were able to then kind of come together with our attorneys and kind of figure out a way of move to move forward. Now the Planning Commission has passed a new plan, which we're supportive of. I, I do favor and I do support uh, trying to get to more, um, more access in appropriate locations. The reality is that medicinal marijuana dispensaries are not a probably appropriate in neighborhoods. But there are places in commercial corridors, in industrial areas, places where people can still get access to, that those, that, uh, that those would be good places to have them located. We're working on a plan, and I think that we'll come up with them pretty soon. Great. Ann T. Johansson Wright. Uh, submitted a question uh, just moments ago. What is your personal opinion on the recent Supreme Court ruling on the separation of church and state, specifically as it applies to opening public city council meetings with prayers, and how will you ensure that all members of our vibrant and religiously diverse Long Beach community are respected and included, not just those who may be Christians? Uh, that, that's a great question. I, by the letter of the law, there should be a separation of church and state. Now, our founding fathers could have uh, formed us as a theocracy, which is in Iran, where all the laws have to align with the Quran. That's not what they chose to do. Uh, what they chose to say is there's a separation between church and state, and we need to respect that. And I think that as we've progressed uh, as a community and as a society, we've uh, we certainly had a lot of you know Christian leadership early on, and I think it influenced some of the things that we did that may not have 100% aligned with the separation of church and state, and we're dealing with you know, those different uh, community aspects of how do we deal with prayer in schools or how do we deal with, with prayer at city council when the law says that there's a separation of church and state, this may not be representing everyone. There are people who are Muslim. There are people who are non-religious, people who have different other religious beliefs. And I think that as we wrestle through that and we become a more perfect union, that we're going to respect everyone and we need to make sure that in doing that, that we abide by the law. And so, you know, personally, I'm a Christian. I have no problem with saying that we shouldn't have prayer and opening prayer in our city council, that that's something that I should do in my own private time uh, and at home uh, or at my church or with my family. But while we're on government time and government facilities, mm -hmm. I have no problem with saying that we ought to respect that to make sure that everyone feels included uh, and that no one feels uh, ostracized or, or excluded. 
Robert. And there's no question that the separation of church and state is important. Uh, I'm Catholic myself. I've worked at a Catholic high school before, uh, and I'm certainly it's a big part of my life. But uh, when it comes to the business of the people and to government, there has to be a clearly defined separation between the two. Uh, this, one of the great things about this country is the respect of religious freedom and the ability of people to, for, to believe in what they, you know, what they believe in and in their God and their religion and uh, their holy book. And so I think it's important that that stays clear. Uh, at the city council right now, we do not have prayer uh, before. We have a moment of silence for people to reflect on uh, whatever it is they want to reflect on. And I think that's uh, the right policy and that should continue. Uh, I think we just have maybe a couple of minutes before our next and final break, but Max Estrada asked a question, and, it is, and he's asking for a colleague of his who doesn't have Facebook, and that's Gaynell. And the question is, she would like to know, as mayor, will you have any future implementations uh, of how to fix the parking situation for all of Long Beach? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, we, that, that certainly is a major issue, and it's even worse in certain areas. Uh, I, I think that some of it is about not having enough access to parking, and some of it is about uh, not having enough, um, you know, you know, I would say travel between the parking, right? So having some type of trolley downtown to be able to get us from parking lots to certain buildings that we want to get to, or even getting from downtown proper on Ocean and then getting down into the Pike area, we should c contemplate having some type of trolley system to go between all the different parking we have, because we have plenty of parking downtown, but trying to get between buildings and get from downtown proper down to the Pike area, th that could be a challenge. So I think that's one way to address that. And then you have areas where there's pinched parking, you know, areas around Cal State Long Beach, areas down on 2nd Street, uh, you know, Belmont Shore, Belmont Heights, uh, up there in, uh, on Bixby Nose. And we have to figure out how do we um, build facilities. It comes down to a resource, you know, question. And, um, and, and that's something as resources come back, as revenues continue to grow, as a city council, we're going to have to figure out how do we prioritize these resources to address this. And we would expect that the city council members in those individual districts would lead that discussion on how to develop those solutions. But I certainly would be in favor of uh, putting together solutions to, to, uh, to mitigate our parking issues. And in the minute and about 30 seconds that we have left, Robert, and we can come back if we don't have enough time to answer, what would you say to address that issue? I mean, I, I take a little different approach. I think you certainly can't build your way out of the parking situation. Mm -hmm. You can't build parking lots and parking structures uh, throughout neighborhoods and throughout the city to get more parking. I think what we have to do is a better job of managing the parking that we have currently. There are places we should be using, doing a better job of going out to businesses, allowing park, residents to park there overnight. We do that in the first district with this permitted parking at, at, at private lots. I think it's the right thing to do for residents. And we also gotta do a better job of looking at our whole mobility plan. More, more bicycling, getting more bike lanes, uh, transit for bus. We gotta make sure that the blue line is, is operating and is safe so people, people uh, feel safe on it. Uh -huh. We've gotta make sure that our streets are walkable, they're pedestrian friendly. So we also gotta do a better job of encouraging people to walk, bike, get out of their car, take the metro, uh, uh -huh. and make, make Long Beach a lot more walkable than it is currently. Carpool. It's gonna be very, very diff yeah. difficult to uh, uh, build parking lots throughout the city. I'm certainly not supportive of that. Thank you. Well. We, we have a break, and before we go uh, to that break, I just want to remind you to keep sending in. Uh, go to our padnet.tv uh, website. Keep sending in your questions, because if I can't answer them here, uh, if they can't, I won't, but if they can't, uh, we will make sure that we get the questions uh, to our candidates. They can then answer them, and we will post them up on our site so that you can see those answers. When we return, we will have about 15 minutes to wrap up with a few more of your questions and encourage you to stay tuned for future perspectives on other council districts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Beverly O'Neill, and did you know that on this channel, you can watch a program called The Heart of Giving. It is dedicated to bringing to you the wonderful work of the nonprofits of the city of Long Beach. It's on, on Mondays and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. on Charter 32 and Verizon 41. It's also streaming live and video on demand. We hope you join us. It'll make you feel better.
Welcome back again. I'm Derek Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Honored to be here with you and with our candidates for Mayor of Long Beach. And in our last segment, we were asking questions that were submitted by you for me to pass on to the candidates. And Mr. Jim Lewis asked a question, and I think it's a great one, Jim. He says, what do you see as a positive quality in your opponent? Mr. Garcia, let's start with you. <laughs> uh, well, I think certainly, uh, I. Damon's hairstyle, I really like. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That, uh, that afro gets them every time. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I was just messing with laughing about it earlier today. No, actually, I, I, one thing I do admire about Damon is um, he is a, certainly a man of faith and uh, mm -hmm. speaks to his values as a, as a Christian, and I respect that as someone that is Catholic myself and that where faith has always been a big, important part of my life. I think that... Um, I know that he's active or has been active, continues to be active in his church and has been for a long time. Uh, I believe he's a pastor as well. Um, and so I, I, I admire that. I think that's a, a great quality. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think um, he has a, a, a good uh, view of how he views the world through, through his faith, and I think that's important. Great. Well, I like Robert's blue tie. <laughs> but no, I, um, no he, Robert loves Long Beach. Right. I think anyone that um, that spends time with him. I got to know him a lot during the, um, all the candidate forums that we had um, in the primary. And what's evident is the young man loves Long Beach. And I admire his passion and his commitment. Uh, he certainly has worked very hard while he was at Cal State Long Beach uh, to, be a, um, to be president of the student body. Uh, I think that he's done a good job, you know, fighting his way uh, into the political sphere and, and going from being a Republican to a Democrat. That's very hard. And to be able to win a seat and to gain the respect of all of his peers, uh, and I think that um, that's something I look at and say he's got tenacity, mm -hmm. and I think that he's done a good job while he's been at City Council, mm -hmm. trying to um, make the best decisions that he can. I certainly don't agree with every decision, but mm -hmm. I certainly can never question his commitment or his passion for this right. city. And and you know, it's actually quite an honor and a pleasure to be able to pursue this opportunity with you, man. So let's mm -hmm. have a good time. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Jim, great question, great answers, gentlemen. Thank you. I hopefully won't hack up the name too bad, but Malia Hers, I believe it is. Her question is for both candidates regarding disparity in infrastructure resource allocation per district. Each council district is allocated X dollars and uh, divided equally amongst districts for the improvement and repairing of infrastructure. How would you change that policy so that the most run down areas and pockets of Long Beach would receive more funding over the areas that do not need it at all. For example, 6th District would need it more than 3rd District. Well, you know, all, there are, you know, that's, there are improvement and infrastructure necessities in every district. And some districts have a lot more, and she's accurate, and some have a lot less, but there's not enough resources to do it all anywhere, and there's enough uh, of a need in every district that we need to be allocating resources to do it. Um, are we going to go back and reallocate resources so that we, you know, take care of, you know, another district needs it less? We could spend 100% of the resources in probably District 6 and, and maybe some areas in 9 and probably 8 north of Delamo uh, and probably on the west side in 7, west of the 710. We could spend all the money there and over the next 20 years not fix all the work that needs to be done and probably not even catch it up to some of the other areas. And, and I certainly wouldn't advise that kind of a policy. But I do think that uh, the new city council, we have five new city council members, six come November, and we're going to be in a position to sit down and to have some of these difficult discussions. I'm not in favor of moving all dollars to certain districts. I would listen to saying if we want to have a disproportionate allocation, if the city council members agreed to it, uh, then I would listen to that uh, and certainly uh, support it if they agreed to it. Uh, but I would not be in favor of taking all dollars out of every district and, and saying, you know, and only three right. districts are going to get resources. That, to me, is a little too draconian. Um, but, but if the city council members agreed to a different allocation, I would be open to it. I prefer the equal distribution, mm -hmm. but, but, I, but I'd be open to uh, evaluating it uh, on a basis that the city council would uh, promote and, um, and agree to. Okay. Mr. So, Mr. actually, we actually don't have equal division right now. And so the way it's actually done is it's 50% of that infrastructure budget is spread, is spread among the nine council districts and another 50% of it is done by need. And so right now we kind of have a hybrid combination uh, of the two. I think that's a good approach. Um, we we got to make sure that we are 
addressing the need. We have some districts that have an incredible infrastructure need. Uh, and we also, so, th so that piece of that puzzle is important uh, for us to solve. I think that uh, taking care of those areas is important. But also, like Damon said, it's important that we focus on the whole city. The reality is that there's, there's communities in Long Beach that may not have as big of a need, but there's a lot more street in those neighborhoods. So you right. take parts of East Long Beach, for example. Wow. Uh, there's parts of East Long Beach that, uh, that are just streets and streets of neighborhoods and neighborhoods uh, that go on for miles. And you have to also fill that need. The need may not be as con as dense or concentrated, right. but you have pothole issues and alley issues. So it's important that resources are are spread uh, across uh, the city. It's also important to note that the city, I believe, has made the right investment and the right decisions in rebuilding a lot of the infrastructure across the city. I get calls all the time about, oh, you're fixing another street, or oh no, there's you know too much construction. And you're right, you know, yeah. it, it, it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. We yeah. are rebuilding a lot of the city. We are investing a lot more uh, into our roads and into our highways. You're seeing a lot of great improvements, traffic signals. We're renovating a lot of the uh, from downtown to uh, parts of, of Second Street and Belmont Shore to parts of North Long Beach. And so that investment is important. We need to continue that investment uh, and, and make sure that we're fixing the city not just on need, but also on uh, on, on sharing the wealth a little bit across the city. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Colleen McDonald asks, I would like to hear the candidates discuss what could be done by the mayor and council to attract substantial new businesses to districts like the Wrigley Village on Pacific Avenue or along Willow Street. There are way too many storefronts, both old and new, that have remained empty for many, many years. Mr. Garcia, you want to start there? Sure. Well, I think, I mean, there's there's... I mean, there's different approaches, and one of the things that we've done in uh, my downtown district and in the first district is we've been very aggressive in retail recruitment and just trying to bring uh, new people to Long Beach. I think there's a lot of similarities to that part uh, of, of Wrigley and Pacific where, where she's talking about to, for example, the North Pine area uh, in right. downtown. Right. And North Pine is going through an incredible renaissance of yeah. cafes and yeah. art galleries and... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the press telegram just moved in up down the street. We have new uh, vintage shops opening up. And that's all just happened in the last few years. And these are quality locations and retailers. And I think the reason why is because we've been working hard at it. We've been meeting. We've been talking to retailers. We've been encouraging small businesses. We've been providing uh, small business grants and facade grants. Uh, the neighborhood has been teaming up uh, to create new, new associations and new partnerships. And so all of that is incredibly important. It's incredibly important to have a, a city that is open for business, that's working with the neighborhoods to do this. a lot of this recruitment. I'm a big supporter of business improvement districts. You look at what's happened in Bixby Knowles. Now we're, we're starting one now up in North Long Beach. We obviously have one in downtown, in Belmont Shore, but business improvement districts work. I think the, the Wrigley area has incredible infrastructure on the small business side to really renovate and, and do some incredible work there. The city has spent um, a pretty significant amount of money up and down the Pacific Corridor and, and throughout parts of Wrigley, but we still need to work on the retail component to bring the, the right retailers there. Great, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think what's critical here, um, you know, I've built shopping centers mm -hmm. and I've had the, the opportunity to be able to lease uh, to different, you know, business owners or any shopping centers and you can see which businesses behind these closed doors actually do well. It's the ones that go out into the community, that build relationship, create this kind of civic responsibility, and the ones that don't, they don't do as well. And I think a great example of someone doing it on a wholesale level is Blair Cohen and what they're doing up there uh, on First Fridays. Right. They've done a good job. Every shopping center that's built, they've got about a two and a half mile, three mile radius where people are going to shop there. You know, no one's gonna shop from Bixby Knowles and go do their shopping down on 2nd Street and mm -hmm. Belmont Heights. And so what you have to do is connect the community with the shops that are there. You can recruit, but if you just recruit and there's no connection, uh, then those businesses will not succeed. But if you go out into the community and you survey them over a two mile radius, what do you want to see? What do you want to have here? And they give you back feedback that we want, you know, X restaurant, that we want to have, you know, these type of service, uh, you know, opportunities, mm -hmm. then, or we want a drugstore. Now you can take that back and you can bring those businesses in and the community has the buy-in and they're going to have a sense of civic responsibility to, to, to shop there and to be there. Their input was collected and that's how you allow those businesses to sustain and to, and to, and to thrive. There has to be community buy-in uh, around that two and a half, three mile radius because that's where they're going to spend their dollars. And if you don't get them what they need, and if they were not asked, then you're going to have a difficult time of sustaining mm -hmm. that uh, long term. Okay, gentlemen, we're, we're within that five minute window, and okay. I want to get in a couple of questions. So I'm going to go back to that elevator pitch mode and okay. try to okay. expedite these questions. D. Abrams, 
uh, in an earlier debate, candidate Garcia said that he would continue Mayor Foster's policies, but that he is his own person and would do some things differently. What would both candidates, would both candidates give specific examples of what they would change from the current leadership in the city and what they would continue? Was that clear? Yeah, yes. it was clear. Okay. Robert, would you like to Sure, start? and I, I, I'm trying to remember, I think the reference was to uh, continuing the fiscal policies. I, those are fiscal mm -hmm. policies that I worked on. I absolutely support those, and I think from a financial point of view, we've got to keep those policies going moving forward. Okay. Uh, as far as, as uh, beyond that, I think that, um, you know, I, I, you probably couldn't find two more different people out there than, than Mary Foster and I when it comes to personality. You know, and He's mm -hmm. a great guy. I'm proud to have his support and endorsement uh, for mayor. Uh, but I think that things, you know, the great thing about democracy is it brings change. It brings a different style. It brings a different leader uh, into the office. And uh, I know where I'm different. I think for me, mm -hmm. uh, I really believe that you can have great, you can build consensus in a different way. I believe that there's a, the ability for us and for council members to take a lead on issues that they care about. I think that you have, you have experts on the city council in certain areas, whether it's in labor law or business or law mm -hmm. or health care. And I think it's important for those council members to be able to have an opportunity to take a leadership role in those areas and in a lot of ways take a citywide leadership role in, in, in those areas. Uh, I also think that, the, that Long Beach has a responsibility and if we're going to move forward the right way to help those people in our community that need our help the most. We have a 20% poverty rate in, in, in the city of Long Beach and if we're not working on ensuring that those people have access to health care, that they get a quality education, that they're able to earn uh, a decent living with a, with a decent wage, those are things that I want to focus on. We weren't mm -hmm. able to focus on those before. We were trying to obviously uh, fix the sinking ship when it came to finances. We did that, but I'll have a different approach when it comes to really going out into those communities. In a minute and 30. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Bob did a good job, you know, quite honestly. He right. cut $134 million from the general fund, 784 positions from City Hall at a time where we went through this huge, great recession. Uh, I think what I'm going to do differently, and I'll have the opportunity to do that, is to focus on growing our economy. We need more general fund revenues uh, to be able to fund all the services and all the infrastructure projects and library hours and after school projects. You know, in my private sector career, I developed 31 projects. Uh, each one of those projects, I worked with city councils, I worked with planning departments, transportation departments, environmental remedi remediation groups, neighborhood coalitions. All of us came together to provide these projects that I served as a catalyst for and increase the bottom line of general fund revenues, property tax, sales tax, business tax. I'm going to have more of an economic development driven focus uh, from the mayor's office uh, and I'm going to focus on bringing everybody to the table. I think there are at times uh, where people who are in West Long Beach and North Long Beach uh, that they don't feel that they were had equal access you know to the mayor or equal access uh, to resources and I want to make sure that everybody's at the table and everything is on the table. Thank you gentlemen. Incredible answers, incredible dialogue. We appreciate it. We appreciate you watching. We hope that you've been excited by the responses that you've uh, heard tonight, that you tell a friend what's going on with PadNet. We've come to the end of tonight's show. Thanks to you and to everyone who's posted questions for the candidates. The questions that were posted before or during tonight's show that we did not get to ask will be sent to the candidates and we will post their responses. Remember to check out the rest of our election perspective series. Next week on May 14th, we'll talk with City Council District 1 candidates Lena Gonzalez and Misi Tagaloa. Then on May 28th, we'll talk with City Council District 5 candidates Carl Kemp and Stacy Mungo. Visit the elections page at padnet.tv to view the video on demand for all of LBCAP and PadNet's election programming and for links to the Facebook page event where you can post your questions for the candidates. Thanks again to our guests, for coming on this show, for our great PadNet crew who's made this a very professional look for us in the city of Long Beach, and for you, wherever you are in the world, for caring about the future of our great city. Thank you.